and welcome back to Like Razorblade Pie, a bite-sized book club about the short speculative fiction of my favorite author of all time, Harlan Ellison. And oh, you guys, gals, and NBs, it is a big one. We're talking I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream today, arguably one of, if not Ellison's most notable story. Uh, adapted into a video game, as I'll discuss with my guest today, and uh, many other languages and various media uh, made him a lot of money his whole life. And if you've heard of Harlan Ellison, chances are it's because of either that or uh, his second most famous story, Repent Harlequin Said the TikTok Man. Um, so it's either that or I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. God, he's good at titles. Just evocative-ass titles. And... Uh, yeah, we're going to dig into it. It's it's basically his number one hit, so I'm really, really excited. Uh, I want to say a few words about it just from the expanded information like I gleaned from the intro. And the uh, in fact, this is such a famous story. The edition I read for this, there's a memoir after it that's longer than the story where he just <laughs> explains what the story means to him, how it's been instrumental to his career and how it came about and how it was received, et cetera, et cetera. But there's only a few things I wanted to say about it. One is that this story won the first ever Nebula Award and also the Hugo that year. Um, so if you know sci-fi and sci-fi awards, those are the big two, the Hugo and the Nebula. And this was the first thing to ever win both because the Nebula had just been invented. Uh, and I also think it's very notable for fans of uh, a book club that I was previous part of, previously part of, Kurt Vonnegut's. People, uh, fans of that podcast, I think, will be gratified to learn that the intro to I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, at least the quote unquote definitive edition <laughs> that I read from the introductions by Theodore Sturgeon and also thanks includes thanks for Knox Berger. So two big figures in Vonnegut's life, also clearly close to Harlan Ellison. And I like finding those crossovers. Also, interestingly, he thanks Ed Wood, the bizarre objectively terrible filmmaker Ed Wood. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff surrounding the story, but let's actually dive into the meat. I've got a phenomenal guest here to discuss it with me, Mr. George Heffler from the Best Little Horror House in Philly Pod. Hi, George. Thanks for being here. Hello. Happy to be here. Also, I might have to come to Ed Wood's defense a little bit. <laughs> oh, oh. Subject, should I have said subjectively bad, I guess? No, no, no. It's fine. They are certainly uh, of, a, of a low quality, but the earnestness is there. Yes, I would call them... Yeah, like if you like if you think Neil Breen is funny, this is sort of one of the first people like that ever. First yes. figures like that. Um, Plan 9 from Outer Space, if you're young enough that you haven't heard from of that. Uh, famous, famous disaster of a film made by this guy, Ed Wood. And in fact, uh, Ed Wood, uh, starring, I think, Johnny Depp as Ed Wood. Was that's that right. right? Yeah, that's Tim a, Burton. Yeah, is, is good as well. So that's Tim Burton's take on Ed Wood. But this is not an Ed Wood podcast. <laughs> Very true. Or a Depp cast. Thank Christ. <laughs> this is a this is a Harlan Ellison podcast. Um, so first of all, I just want to start by I, George. I mean, I met you through your show. And of course, we talk a lot of horror. Uh, and this is certainly a horrifying story. But what is your familiarity with this story slash Harlan Ellison generally coming into this? Yeah, so I'm definitely more familiar with this story in particular than with Ellison in general. Although I, uh, in preparation for this uh, for this podcast, got one of his books of short stories to to, to dig into. Oh boy, but, um, which but, one? Um, oh boy, I don't even remember because I grabbed it from the library. Gotcha. And it was just whatever they had. <laughs> Slippage, Deathbird stories, Angry Candy. Angry Candy. That was it. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, oh that's a yeah. good starter one. You chose oh, I'm one. I'm glad to okay. hear it. Um, but yeah, this game, or rather this story, uh, I first experienced as the video game. It was a classic point and click adventure game, except, you know, <laughs> usually those were like King's Quest, where it was like jokey humor and uh, and and right. lighthearted. Monkey Island. Yeah. Right, Monkey Island, these lighthearted games. And then you have... I have no mouth and I must scream, which not only is uh, voiced am is voiced by Harlan Ellison. He also mm -hmm. helped write a lot of the dialogue for it. And it it like really expands a lot of the story. And so it was just 
and and it's it retains that darkness obviously because it's not only contributed to by him but it, it i think also definitely retains the spirit of it and it's just such like a shock to be expecting one type of thing and just go in the complete opposite direction of it especially when it's still com- completely compelling you know even when you're younger this sort of uh, attraction repulsion <laughs> idea Mm -hmm. is certainly in full effect and watching the all of the things that are attractive about the story all of the um uh, exploitation-y feeling things that you get from watching like b-movies that i get from watching b-movies at least um it's all there and it's all so interesting and then for it to also have meat to dig into and and to be able to explore what it means philosophically i think is is interesting as well and yeah, I I haven't played it, and I'm actually wondering. Not that we're gonna deep dive and get the whole plot of the game version, but I I should play it, and I'm wondering how they managed to pad it out, right? Because it's a pretty <laughs> short story, right? Um, so I'm I guess he made up extra tortures and <laughs> extra things that go wrong, right? Each one of them has to go on their own individual torture, and they're trying torture to quest. Uh, right exactly. It's a classic torture quest, and yeah. they. <laughs> Go and they find out that there are like still the ego and super ego and id of Am are like separate components of him that also exist. And uh, it's just this whole wild thing where you try and uh, actually escape the clutches of Am. So there is actually a, a theoretically happy ending. Uh, but. Ooh, but. and that's, I think, interesting foreshadowing for uh, this actual discussion, which centers around the written words. Yep. Of the short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. So let's move off the video game uh, and let people know who maybe are just listening along or just so we have a, you know, a foundation from which to build. Could you nutshell just the actual short story itself? Like, what is Am? Why do you keep saying Am? <laughs> What's sure. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream about? So the pressures of the Cold War lead the nations of the world to further develop computing power and giving those computers the capability to wage war leads to a nuclear holocaust where AIM, uh, where AM, who is sort of the collective of computers that has gained sentience, um, he seizes control but leaves a handful of people alive to keep him reminded and proficient and hating. And it's really, I think, summed up great by Harlan himself in in this little paragraph where he says... Though he was given intellect beyond the realms of human intelligence and near godlike powers, he could never escape the limitations of his programming, nor could he physically escape the eternal straitjacket of substrata rock where his processors were stored. Driven to madness by his inability to use his powers for anything other than war and death, his quest for vengeance against humanity dominates his every waking moment. Yeah, it's basically the it's kind of skynet there yeah. <laughs> but much more humanized in a single person right there's not a bunch of robot skeletons it's the doomsday scenario where the internet becomes conscious and takes over and it's more of an exploration of how much it fucking hates us and why <laughs> right right uh and uh but as far as the action of the plot uh am has created a hollow space inside the earth where it has full control over anything like reality itself. It seems almost holodeck like Mm -hmm. and uh, is endlessly torturing these humans uh, as George said, as like a keepsake to remind it how much it fucking hates humans like a Tamagotchi that you only, you never clean up its shit. You just punish it. (laughs) You watch it cry for food and say, not today, Tamagotchi. Yeah, exactly. And uh, something I think that's really interesting about the story that comes through in the memoir and the Ted Sturgeon introduction is that Harlan wrote this in the, uh, freeform mode you know there's sort of two modes of writing the person Mm -hmm. who knows who outlines and knows the ending first which is definitely what i am i don't understand these weirdos who do this (laughs) but harlan (laughs) just starts with a single image and swears that he he just sat down at a typewriter and wrote gorister hung from the pink palette suspended by like the sole of his right foot and then he was and then he thought what am I up to? What is this going to be? <laughs> and then you just let the story write itself. Now that almost seems like self-aggrandizing to yeah. me in the sense I'm like, <laughs> well, you had to know the gist or the theme you wanted to explore. But I do believe that there's authors who, you know, in a very valid way, try to 
unleash their subconscious and let the thing just form itself. And uh, Ted Sturgeon said about this, uh, about Harlan's propensity to do this. Most beginners start out formless and then slowly learn how to impose structure. In Harlan's case, I think he quickly learned structure because within a predictable structure, he was safe. He was contained. When he got big enough, good enough, confident enough, he began to write as it came, let it pour out as his inner needs demanded. It is the confidence of freedom and the freedom of confidence. Um, so that just was very inspirational for me and almost, and pairs really well with this story in the sense that it's wild that it's almost like jazz improvisation, right? He mm-hmm. improvised out this ditty, never could have predicted this story would basically be his career. Like this would be his livelihood. Mm-hmm. You know, royalties from this story and adaptations of this story are are make up the bulk of like his lifetime earnings. And uh, it's just interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's and it's about improvisation. It's improvisation on the theme of torture. But uh, I love that all my favorite authors that are actually somehow all knew each other or like, you know, slept together in a big pile. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Like also his editor was Frederick Pohl, who, if you know him is a also very good sci-fi author. But anyway, I digress. Um, back to the story. I'm going to blow right past a question that I usually spend a lot of time on because we primarily know each other through um, talking about horror movies. Mm-hmm. So why do you think I paired this story with you? Horrific. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the big straightforward horror beat one. And I was like, who'd be great for that? George, that's our only connection point. We exist. We have a friendship that exists solely on that level. Um, so, yeah, I picked you because it's the horror one. Works so my, my next question for you, sir, is do you think it lives up to its reputation, both as considered to be one of the best speculative fiction stories of all time and also supposed to be really dark and gut punchy and intense? How did it how did it hit you on that level? I think it does deserve its reputation. I think that it is incredibly intense and upsetting, especially because it is so filled with subjectivity. You know, as as much as it is the straight a- straight ahead horror one, the fact that we're kind of in Ted's perspective makes it uh, similar to when we talked about Synecdoche. You know, you're kind of like, well, how much of this is just like him having been messed with by Am? Um, And the actual imagery is really grotesque. What he's done to their personalities is horrific. It's just really working as torture on so many different ways. And to see how they've been beaten down is uh, is is grim, to say the least. Yeah. And Ellison actually speaks a lot in the memoir about how many people missed that Ted is a paranoid schizophrenic at this point Mm -hmm. or is an unreliable narrator in some ways, but because he never says, and am made me a paranoid paranoiac, (laughs) but, um, but he doesn't have to say it. You're supposed to get the idea from how horrible and cruel he is and how he always assumes the worst intentions of everyone around him. And he also points out that am has warped the other people's personalities. So why wouldn't his personality be warped? Right. Definitely. Um, Especially since he so strongly fights the other direction where he's like, I'm the only one who he left alone. (laughs) It's like, okay, guy. Yeah, sure. Sure he did. Yeah, you seem fine. Uh, So then that leads to I'm I'm skipping around here in the doc I sent you a bit. But do you think do you do you so for me, what's disturbing more than the stuff that Am does to them, which are like they're very inventive, but they're tortures in the way that you can comprehend. Right. Like pain Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. hunger in the extreme or, you know, bad things happening to you physically. Um, What actually upsets me is how mean and cruel uh, the human, the interpersonal interactions are like how far we've been pushed to. And and Hel- Ellison has said that to him, that's the core of the story is like, what do people how do people act when pushed to the extreme? Right. Um, the stripping away of our uh, nobility until we become animals. But then also in his belief, in his way of thinking, uh, a kernel of nobility that can't be destroyed or will suddenly flare up when you'd least expect it. Right. Yeah. And uh so, yeah, that's I don't, I just wanted to know if that's I don't want to speak for you, but like, is that how that skins for you as well? Where it's like, like, what was more upsetting, the fact that they're getting horribly beaten down or the fact that they're mean to each other? That's what got me. <laughs> I mean, I think for me, I think Benny kind of sums it up in a 
in a nutshell of the torture and what's scary about it, you know, because not only is he so far gone from what he was, but he has lost that sort of humanity at, at the end where he's literally like eating his friend's face. Um, and yeah, he's sort of turned into a gibbon over time by right. him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, they talk about how he was gay and that am subverted his sexuality even. And like, uh, and, and how that then diagrams with Ellen's torture and having promiscuity forced on her when chasteness was something that she valued, um, it's just mm. it is it's this idea of forced subversion even the i think applying you can part of what applies to today from this story is with gorister and how he was a commie a conscientious object uh, objector he was a peace marcher he was a planner a doer a looker ahead am had turned him into a shoulder shrugger he had made him dead in his concern am had robbed him and you know a thou- instead of one giant am a thousand cuts from social media and the 24 hour mm. news cycle have a very easy way of deadening you and oh, making and you making feel us despair. assholes to each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Debasing you and humiliating you and making you think it's okay right. to go online and read some random thing. Someone posted just to express themselves and write you fucking suck. I hope <laughs> you die. Like that is not something we would do to each other face to face for the most part. And the internet does allow a much broader swath of people to go there to like, mm-hmm. su- yeah, I, I see interactions online where it's just like, you just snapped and became an asshole for no reason whatsoever. And I'm not talking about fraught political conversations. I'm talking about when people post really innocuous shit and someone <laughs> just goes, just sends hate out into the world, right? Mm-hmm, and I do mm-hmm. think that has, it's not necess- It's not that that person was born hateful or that's innate to them. It's an aspect of the system we've created that it right. engenders these types of uh, parasocial interactions, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's the humiliation and the, Am sort of trying to strip away what makes them human that I that is so profoundly takes it to the next level of disturbing. Um, do you think there's so much fiction about that if so, first of all, do you think it's possible for machine sentience to exist? Let's compare notes on that th- on that classic uh, thought experiment. Sure. And would it necessarily hate humans? Right. Because it's always Skynet fucking hates us mm-hmm. Am fucking hates us. Uh, you know, the, it always launches the nukes and it's always a statement. It's always used usually as a statement on how we kind of deserve it because we suck. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> referendum on he, whether humanity deserves to live. Right. That's what yeah. these stories sort of center around. Um, and I'm not asking you to arbitrate whether humanity deserves to live unless you want to. <laughs> but uh, I like the thought experiment of like, what do you think a robot sentience would be like? Yeah, truly. Do you think it would have humanoid emotions? So. This is, I think, an interesting question, partially because it's hard to say or define what the line is. Like, is it a reasonable facsimile of sentience is sentience? Um, But to actually have a cognition and an interior life in the way that we do, I'm genuinely not sure that I believe that a computer could get there. Um, Mm. And I don't know if maybe the difference to me is coming to it through evolution instead of being designed in that way and designed in a way to replicate that. Um, but I yeah. think, I think that a machine intelligence could hate humans if it was based on human thought patterns, because hate is such an emotional response. And it's so like based in fear that I feel like a coldly logical machine wouldn't get there on its own, especially if it's self-replicating and looking for efficiency, you know, hate is such a waste of energy and time and emotion that, you waste so much bandwidth on worrying about things instead of being efficient like a computer would want to be. That's interesting to think of hate as just a waste of, yeah, it's kind of a heat sink. It's a waste of resources in like, in the, except in like a very slim cases, like maybe you need to summon the feeling hate in order to engage in a crucial battle and Mm -hmm. fight your enemy. But like, For the most part, hate is distracting you from more productive things you could be doing for sure. Uh, That's an interesting take. I also love the take that I think is hinted at in this story, um, but also I just love thinking about is like, if you didn't make, like, let's assume that sentience, the moment, the singularity moment does not coincide, because why would it, or it seems Mm -hmm. unlikely that it would, with a robot body that is also perfectly humanoid. 
you know what I mean? Like those tracks are, there's a, there's people in labs working on humanoid robot fun, you know, motility. Right. And there's people in labs working on making smarter and smarter AI and running it through the Turing test. I doubt that the first time if AI becomes sentient, that it will be, that it will find itself in a, in a, apparatus that has sensory input and can be a meaningful part of the world. Right. And so Am talks about how you gave me consciousness and you don't understand what a torture it is to be just consciousness. I am in hell. Mm -hmm. I am in that's I am in a black void with no sensory input, only consciousness. The only Things that are at my disposal, in this case, this was really dumb of the people, are nukes. So guess what I'm going to fucking do? <laughs> like right. launch the nukes, <laughs> right? So um, if you make a robot and hand it a hammer, it becomes a nailing robot or, you know, Absolutely. that twist on that old saying. But I do think there's an interesting element of um, to just be trapped in like hell begets hell. Like yeah. that it's that we did it to it first. Am was trapped. Am is also trapped in it because it has no, although you start, it starts to become fuzzy when it's like, well, it's a holodeck now. Can't it <laughs> make itself a body? It's like God, but, right. um, I but do, Am has no body and that's one of its main grievances. And I do think that resonates. Absolutely. And one of my favorite Vonnegut stories is Epicac. And I think that this works so interestingly as sort of a mirror image to that where Clearly, one of Kurt's fears is us technologizing ourselves out of existence, you know, player piano as well. Mm. And that extends to art and love for Epicac. But the idea is also like, what does it mean to be human if we don't have that unique ability? And Harlan says here, never mind art and love. What are we literally like? We are literally using robots to replace ourselves in a capacity of war. And what will that do to them and also to us? When the humanism of waging a war is gone, when it just feels like a video game where all you see is a screen from a drone to drop a bomb on people, you know, at some point there were just wars, but it, it not being able or not being forced to look someone in the face, like it, d denying right. that um, or in creating that disconnect uh, through robotics, I think is certainly damaging to us as people as well. And so Am's sort of reflection of that, I think definitely comes through. Yeah, that's very cool. It reminds me of another book I do recommend called The Cold Cash War by Robert Asprin, which the gimmick is that in the future, everyone fights in essentially like laser tag scenarios, but mm -hmm. more sophisticated, like they have choppers and mortars and blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. it's all IR lasers and everyone wears suits that if you get hit, like freeze you in place and at the end, they measure up the totals and you get your country owes the other country <laughs> a fine of however much you lost by. Wow. And so they defeat each other by crippling their economies. Um, but it becomes really, really sinister, right? Because so like it gets into really interesting areas. But the one that I never forget is a guy gets frozen on the battlefield and he has his buddies bury him alive so that he won't get counted. Wow. Wow. That so is, it like people is, are still dying and it makes you think of the stuff that's happening now with these goddamn Boston Dynamics robot dogs uh, with the guns strapped to their backs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, this is not going in a good direction. Whether no. that dog becomes sentient and hates us or not, you don't need that. You need, you could have a human at the end of that <laughs> controlling that robot dog. They're Absolutely. so detached from the process now. Um, I also I, I haven't I haven't yeah. read that book, but it sounds interesting. And I like Robert oh, Asprin from those uh, myth books that he wrote. So I, yeah, I haven't checked yeah. Those. Yeah, Cold Cash War and Fool's Company, both also good. Yeah. Um, oh, and the the Bug Wars. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, we digress. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, so this is one of my favorite depictions of Eternal Torment. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to ask for the record, because I feel like you'd be well-versed in this. Like, what do you think makes Eternal Torment, or the idea of a hell, mm -hmm. uh, in the non-religious sense, any hell that never ends, like, what are your favorites? Which ones have are most evocative to you? And what do you think may, is the magic sauce that makes it work? Like, one that I remember really disturbed me as a child, but has lost some of its luster is like the Hellraiser depiction of hell. Mm -hmm. I do think that does a good job of implying eternity. Eternity is such a key component where you're yeah. like anything bad is so much worse if it's if you can underline that it's eternal. <laughs> you yeah. know, and that goes back to like Tantalus and shit, but yeah, yeah, favorite hells. Uh, so for me, 
my number one at the tippity is probably Risk Cutter is a love story. Um, first of all, Tom Waits is God. Is mm-hmm. That's a great mm-hmm. start. But also, I just think it's kind of interesting in a way because I like these depictions of hell where it's like encouraging you to make the most of your life here because in that, everything is the same except a little worse. Like you just literally mm-hmm. have... Uh, the marks from how you died and uh, and uh, the color palette is a little more muted and you, it's literally impossible to smile. And it's just like, oh, yeah, the worst possible situation would be the thing you were trying to get out of is now just a tiny bit worse. <laughs> um, and I think to that end, I also love Jacob's Ladder and the Silent Hill style of torment where it's like what makes it effective is that same feeling of warped normalcy but in a more Mm -hmm. chaotic, aggressive way. Um, So I think that that is what makes it aggressive, is, like, the idea of inescapability is not from the, like, (laughs) not from just the torture of, like, oh, your flesh is being rended, but also that whatever you are trying to escape is inescapable. I, yeah, I also think something that always gets me is when the, it's when the devil is not, evil like i thirst for blood i just want to see you burn i just Mm want to eat your flesh but is an asshole (laughs) i actually think it's really because i and i think it does come from being i don't know i'm kind of a sensitive guy i don't like being teased even though i'm a comedian like i i in real life i don't go hard (laughs) on like busting balls and the equivalent um and i i'm just i try to be very kind and courteous and polite and i hate it when the devil does shit like <laughs> like mocking you like when they make you you know they starve you for a month and then they give you a warm bottle of boar piss <laughs> to drink like the it's the actual the insult the insult yeah. to injury i do think it's something rubbing it in and am rubs it in in a very human gleeful way that is so impactful to me and is like the best torture to me involves a, some amount of trolling yeah. Like the, I actually do think the internet kind of is hell in some ways <laughs> because, um, man, there's, there's not a lot that's as frustrating to me personally as, uh, someone who just has complete power over you and is just a very simple, straightforward asshole idiot. <laughs> they just hate you and they're just going to be a dick about it. I think that yeah. sucks. I love that. I, There's it, no elegant Hellraiser. The Hellraiser Cenobites <laughs> all try to be classy and shit. None of that. <laughs> Am is like a street fighter. Am kicks you in the nuts. That's right. And I think this is where I'll recommend the audiobook version of this story as well, which is read by Harlan Ellison. And he is such an amazing narrator for Am because he. Has a punchable he face. Oh voice. my God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he's just so gleeful. Like, you can. Like, it makes you feel like when he was writing these that he was like, oh my God, this is so good. Like, these are going to get these guys. <laughs> and, I'm going to fucking get these assholes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. When when he's reading, like, the boar urine line and he's like, we mm-hmm. ate it. <laughs> it's like, oh my yeah, God, Harlan. <laughs> Um, let's see. Did oh, I wanted to ask anything. Did anything f- seem silly or dated to you now that it's I mean, how old is this story? Gosh. Um, one thing that definitely felt silly to 60s, me. Sixties, yeah. Fifty well, years, sixty years. <laughs> was just like literally at the beginning, compared to the rest of the stuff, that they mm-hmm. it starts with them just like finding a like a corpse hanging upside down really makes it feel like am is saying they're like all right i'm running out of ideas how can i get these guys uh upside down corpse that'll yeah, do it that's what i mean <laughs> i do think it's interesting that there's core things like being lonely forever being trapped forever physical mm-hmm. pain these don't go out of style yeah but uh there is there's no question that the details become dated because they're an aspect of, you know, the zeitgeist of the time. Right. Um, so yeah, I thought the gore story, <laughs> that's the one that got me. It's funny that he enshrines in the memoir, what a sacred moment it was that that image came to him first. And I'm like, I actually would have gone back to the beginning and edited <laughs> that to match. Cause the rest, cause it gets better and better from that point forward, but whatever. Yeah. yeah if I had been, I'll just say this. If I'd been punished for a thousand years, with like birds that cause hurricane winds and you know, all this crap, like 
my friend slowly devolving into a feral beast man. Mm-hmm. Um, if I found a dead body hanging upside down, I'd be like, whatever. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the least of my worries at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I think I already know your answer, but I think we got to get into it because at the time it was a highly controversial aspect of the story and I think remains misunderstood by some readers. But what did you think of the de- depiction of Ellen and that whole love triangle characterization. Um, yeah, I, because yeah, as we alluded to, Benny is sort of this feral guy who has lots of sex with Ellen and Ted, our narrator, is constantly saying, and she loves it because she's such a slut. Right. That fucking bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and obviously that rubs us the wrong way, but like how did you contextualize that in, in terms of the story? Yeah, I think that it is partially just that it is filtered through the subjectivity of Ted, but also I think that part of the greatest torture of Am is reminding us of his lack of humanity, and the way that he can do that is by using humanity's hang-ups against ourselves, our fears and jealousies and sexualities and our connections, and these are things that are theoretically left behind by post-humanism and with the sterility of a computer mind, and... Part, like am hating humanity it makes sense to me that he would want to use these things that make us human to become mm-hmm. our nightmares yeah yeah and i just to be very clear because i do think it's an important takeaway that harlan you know opined on ever since the story came out um he thinks this is a happy story with an upbeat ending because in the end ted Knowing that it will lead to his eternal damnation, he'll now now be he'll be alone forever. Like the one thing that could make this worse is being alone, right? And he murders Ellen and Benny uh, in a split second when Am is like distracted, thereby freeing them from this hellish existence. Um, and a lot of people, I think, or at the time, some some read it as, oh, it just devolves into this horrible killing at the end. What a bummer story. But from Harlan's vantage, and I think it's pretty clear, so I hope people got this from the story, uh, Ted is not is A, wrong about Ellen. Like George said, it's subjective. It's just through his lens. But also, that's supposed to be that tiny spark of human nobility and soul that can't be crushed. Ted is mercy killing his friends to save them from hell and and is doing so with a, 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 like immense sacrifice because he's going to yeah. be fucked forever now. <laughs> and in fact, Am says, oh, oh, it's going to be real bad now, pal, you know, <laughs> essentially. And so like that's supposed to be which is funny. It's supposed to be really heartwarming and uplifting when he crushes their heads <laughs> at the end of the story, because um, that's all you can do, right? If you're faced with the devil itself, like definitely, escape. I think the sure. peace of death. I mean, is is mm-hmm. is certainly alluring in this. But they've talked about how many times they've tried to commit suicide from this, and yeah. a- additionally, just the fact that he is able to overcome Am's torture in a way that had just been happening because directly previous to this was him being like i fled like a cockroach across the floor and out into the darkness and everybody laughed at me and hated me and then this paranoia that's that's fueling him he manages to overcome it and sacrifice himself at the end like you're saying um Mm. i think it is noble of ted to do this yeah i agree um but i understand people who read it and were like texturally i just don't like how he's always calling ellen a slut i'm like yeah sure. no i i didn't either that does make me cringe but i think it's supposed to yeah um and i think harlan also agrees that that's not how you treat people <laughs> um ideally uh i'm actually going to skip the question about am's monologue because i'm reading it again and i'm like well all he really says is hate 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 mm. hate, hate, hate. Um, <laughs> but it is clear it is clear <laughs> it's very clear it's very clear I guess the part that is interesting to me is, do you think we're meant to understand Am's point of view at all? I think we are, you know, in the same way that there are people who, like, curse their parents for, you know, I didn't consent to being born. Uh, Being alive, being alive is is a heavy burden. And and (laughs) (laughs) it really is. And he's like we said, he's being tortured as well. He can't even move. Like, he has this mm-hmm. intellect, and all he can do is wage war. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I absolutely He's alone understand. Too. Yeah. There's I, no other AI to talk to. Yeah. I totally get it. I, why he would in this situation. 
Yeah, I think the lesson here is if we are ever going to create sentient AI, we should make a really nice, we should make a matrix <laughs> for it first. Yeah. We should make oh, yeah. a little playpen that's very enriching for it to like exist within that will make it happy and reasonable. <laughs> like if you're going to raise a child of science, sure. right? Raise it, raise it like you would a child. Like it needs a love and attention if it has sentience. Yeah. Maybe it could just needs live respect. in the matrix, like the movie, the matrix. That sounds hey, fun. <laughs> check out our matrix episode of after hours. It's very confusingly written, but that's ultimately what it's trying to say is wow. that I actually think it's more likely it's less like so the idea that machines will put us in a matrix is less likely than the idea that we would put machine sentience in a matrix because yeah. that would keep it busy and keep it from killing us and also <laughs> allow us to program life lessons into it. Like, you know, you yeah. can acculturate it and make it humanoid by give, feeding it human experiences, whereas why would the machines put us in a matrix to keep us alive so they can batteryize us? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> anyway, that brings us to Harlan's parlance. Um, where we just shout out any favorite passages, uh, and George has already been bringing the heat, but were there any other passages that really spoke to you that you wanted to shout out? Uh, well, first, I'll just say that Daddy the Deranged is a funny and great title for Am. Uh, oh, yeah, Daddy the <laughs> Deranged, sure. <laughs> uh, he also, at one point, I think it's really interesting that he says, at first, Am meant allied master computer, then it meant adapted men adaptive manipulator and later on it developed sentience and linked itself up and they called it an aggressive menace but then but by uh -huh. then it was too late and finally it called itself am emerging intelligence and what it meant was i am cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am and it's so interesting to me because seeing the development of the name how it starts neutral then becomes an epithet with aggressive menace and mm -hmm. then finally he takes it onto himself as a boast i think therefore i am uh, I think that it's just a really cool way of developing his personality. Very quickly. Yeah. I think one of Ellison's strongest things, and it becomes very apparent that he loves this if you read a lot of Ellison, are lists of elements that are technically too long. Like if you were a writing instructor, you'd go, you can trim this down. But <laughs> no, because every single item, it's like a little collection of items. And you're like, every item is so evocative. Uh, one passage that I think really captures that is there was the smell of matted wet fur in the cavern. There was mm. the smell of charred wood. There was the smell of dusty velvet. There was the smell of rotting orchids. There was the smell of sour milk. There was the smell of sulfur, rancid butter, of oil slick, of grease, of chalk dust, of human scalps. Uh, any English professor would say, surely you can cut that down. <laughs> and I would say, nah. That's that's his signature. That's what makes him awesome. It's is great. He's like a smorgasbord of evocative imagery. Yeah. And it's it's like overwhelming in a way that you can imagine the smell would be. Yeah. In that specific example. Obviously, I understand your point at large as well. Right. <laughs> um, let's see. I also got another paragraph I want to dive into. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, gigantic, the words immense, monstrous, grotesque, massive, swollen, overpowering, beyond description. There on a mound rising above us, the bird of winds heaved with its own irregular breathing, its snake neck arching up into the gloom beneath the North Pole, supporting a head as large as a Tudor mansion, <laughs> a beak that opened slowly as the jaws of the mo most monstrous crocodile ever conceived. Sensuously, ridges of tufted flesh puckered about two evil eyes as cold as the view down into a glacier crevasse ice blue and somehow moving liquidly it heaved and lifted its great sweat colored wings in a movement that was certainly a shrug then it settled and slept talons fangs nails blades it slept <laughs> no yeah. one writes like that it just <laughs> to me that's the equivalent of like a bucket head solo of writing <laughs> it's just like that's metal as shit yeah uh, that's great yeah um, I also, I think part of what makes this story and his writing so great to me is just the, like, the little tiny bits where he's like, three days it had been since we'd last eaten, worms, thick, ropey, and it's like, <laughs> he didn't need to go into this great big uh, digression, you know, he just throws a few all. details in that really paint a picture, uh, just great stuff. Uh, yeah, when he describes uh, Nimdok slash Benny as 
wandering off into the dark and coming back all pale and shaking, but they don't know what Am is doing to him. Mm -hmm. Like there's even tortures that they're not privy to. I love that there he gives us that imagination space. And uh, again, the repetition thing he does, I really like. Speaking of hunger, when he talks about stomachs that were merely cauldrons of acid now, bubbling, oh, foaming, yeah. shooting spears of sliver thin pain into our chests. It was the pain of the terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal paresis, unending pain. And we passed through the cavern of rats, and we passed through the path of boiling <laughs> steam, and we passed through the country of the blind, and we passed through the slough of despond, and we passed through the veil of tears. Uh, yeah, it's, he folds, like George is saying, tiny little tortures into single sentences where he's like, oh, also incidentally, we spent a thousand years, you know, uh, getting butt fucked by a chainsaw. He'll just like <laughs> shove that into uh, one sentence and move on. Yeah. Bad Very millennium. powerful. Yeah. Um, that's all I got. You got any others? Uh, no, I, well, I just, I, I like the description of the nuclear hellscape of Earth's surface as the blasted skin of what had once been the home of billions. Evocative. Imagist, imagist shit. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. I think that brings us to my favorite segment. Oh, yeah, it does. Hooray. Which is, uh, where we lighten the mood a bit in this case by, um, <laughs> dispensing stupid one-liners about the story we just read because I want there to be jokes in existence about every Harlan Ellison short story because I know there aren't yet. <laughs> um, so did you do the homework, I, You better believe I did it. All right, great. You want to start us off? Uh, sure. I've heard of not being a morning person, but saying you're being tortured by the AM is taking it a little far. Ha! <laughs> uh, I got... Meanwhile, there's five people trapped in the FM robot, and they're having a great time. Crystal clear reception, the whole nine yards. Um, so I, I bristled when the narrator said that Nimdok's name had been assigned because Am was amused by strange sounds. And I was like, hey, man, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with being amused by strange sounds. Okay, <laughs> don't attack me. Uh, I got, uh, um... Have you tried unplugging it and plugging it back in? <laughs> I like imagining I like imagining warping in and just telling Ted that. <laughs> yeah, have you jiggled Am's cable? <laughs> um in their hungry hungry hunt for the rock, like they're going to try and kill it mm -hmm. so that they can eat it. Mm -hmm. And he lists a bunch of places that they walk through, and one of them is a cavern of rats, and he just brushes past it. And I'm like, hey man, go back there. Probably a way better, easier place to kill things. Eat, eat the some rats. rats. <laughs> eat the rats. Wow, that's a great point. Uh, I like this. See, you're you're doing like observational shit. I could spin <laughs> this out into a five minute. <laughs> set <laughs> like stand up set on I have no mouth and I'm a scream. All right. Last but not least, I pass through the cavern of rats and I pass through the path of boiling steam and I pass through the country of the blind and I pass through the slough of despond and I pass through the veil of tears and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we did it. Now jokes exist about I have no mouth and I'm a scream and you can't say they don't. We Hell wrote yeah. 6 of them. Hell yeah. Screw you all. No, well thank done. you so much, people who read along, and thank you for listening. And thank you, George. This was a great conversation about a great story. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure, truly. Yeah. Uh, please let folks know where they can find you and your work and what you're up to. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks again for having me. Truly, uh, what an honor. Have a wonderful time. And uh, I my can pleasure. be, yeah, my, I can be found at Little Horror PHL on Twitter, but that name applies pretty much everywhere. But Twitter is mostly the place to find me because my show is the best little horror house in Philly. It's the show where we talk about the best horror movie ever made, according to our guest, at least. And uh, as Michael alluded to, he has been on the show and we had a really great time talking about Antichrist. Um, if you uh, enjoy these kind of conversations about the uh, horror movies and, and what makes them so great and, and finding something to love about each one, uh, you'll like the show. So check it out. Another very dark piece of fiction. Antichrist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Well, I am so pleased that we had an amazing, fruitful discussion in 45 minutes, which has always been the goal of this show. That's why I call it a bite-sized book club, but every single time it's gone like an hour 15. <laughs> so thank you for being uh, computer-like in your efficiency. <laughs> 
now I fear that you will torture me forever with your amazing powers of Bleep, sentience bloop. and observation. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. We got to get out of here. Um, thanks for listening, y'all. Follow me on Twitter at Swaim underscore Corp. If you want to keep up with the pod, I will be posting uh, ahead of time what we'll be reading next episode, which I haven't decided yet. So I'm going to go dig through some Harlan Ellison stories and get back to you. Until then, this has been a Small Beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The Beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash smallbeans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the Small Beans grow into huge, giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!